She was the mother of a year-old baby girl. New clues tonight in the desperate nationwide search for that mother who vanished without a trace on Thanksgiving. Someone knows where she's at. Kelsey Barrett's mysterious disappearance captivated the country. Patrick, why don't you talk to us? As questions swirled about her fiance, Patrick Frazee's involvement. He is now in handcuffs right up there. Today, the next chapter of the saga opening in Colorado as Frazee's murder trial begins. With every potential juror, he locked eyes as if he wanted to communicate with them. The prosecution's main weapon, a former lover who could make or break the case. You have a man accused of killing his fiance, the mother of his one-year-old, in a plot with an ex-girlfriend. I mean, this has all the, the makings of a TV movie. I started picking up things that were blood splattered that I would have a hard time getting blood out of. Did you leave uh, blood anywhere else that yeah. you didn't clean up? Yeah. This video is a rare and shocking instance of police cooperation. Someone involved in a crime showing the investigators around the crime scene. There was blood over every surface, on the walls, on the couch, on the TV, on tables, in the kitchen. It was on soft materials too, materials that couldn't be cleaned like pillows and baby toys. These items the accomplice disposed of. She spent hours scouring the scene meticulously until it sparkled. But whose blood was this? And what did this woman, the one who cleaned it up, have to do with it? This is the story of Kelsey Barrett, who went missing on Thanksgiving Day 2018. She was the mother of a one-year-old daughter. Missing for 10 days before her disappearance was reported, this Colorado mother had fallen victim to a devastating crime and a chilling cover-up. Phone records, threats, and traces of blood. Let's uncover the truth about the twisted killing of Kelsey Barrett. This case takes us to the pleasant alpine town of Woodland Park, Colorado. Surrounded by forest and the beautiful Rocky Mountains, it's known as a popular retirement destination and a base for tourists wanting to explore the alpine peaks. The town's major selling point is its proximity to unspoiled wilderness and all the dangers that suggests. So, when someone goes missing in a safe, idyllic region like this, it's often the elements and the landscape to blame. Is that what happened to Kelsey Barrett, pictured here in the last footage of her alive? This surveillance footage was recorded on Thanksgiving Day, November 22, 2018, in a Safeway in Woodland Park. Seen with her one-year-old daughter held secure in a car seat, Kelsey's behavior seemed nothing out of the ordinary. She pushed a shopping cart around as she collected her groceries, seemingly ignorant that ten days later she would be reported missing. It was easy to imagine that she might have driven onto an isolated road and encountered an emergency situation. Woodland Park's sub-Arctic climate, averaging around 25 degrees Fahrenheit at this time of year, could turn deadly quickly with a one-year-old in the car. She was also a pilot. Perhaps she'd absconded in one of her workplace's planes or run into difficulty while out flying. There were any number of possibilities. But Kelsey, 29, was a sensible, practical person. Kelsey grew up in Moses Lake, Washington, as a country girl. She was raised on a hay farm and spent her childhood driving tractors and maneuvering hay bales. Her passion, however, was always flying planes. She went to pilot school in Washington and moved to Colorado as a flight instructor, working at Falcon Air Base and later DOS Aviation. Her students loved to fly with her, and her bosses were impressed, saying it seemed like it was something as stressful as it was, and it's meant to be stressful, that was handled well. She was a diligent teacher who kept herself grounded, despite working in a business that was adrenaline-fueled and held the whole potential of the skies. But she was also a person who followed her passions. Kelsey had been dreaming of becoming a pilot since she was young, Having been raised on an isolated farm with only her brother for company, she wanted adventure. And she found it, not only in her career, but in her love life too. 
browsing a dating website in 2016 when she was 27, a certain man caught her eye. This man was a cowboy from Colorado named Patrick Frazee. Born in 1986, Patrick was three years older than Kelsey and shared many of her interests and background. He was a Colorado native from a tiny ranching town called Florissant, where he operated a 35-acre ranch to make his living. There, he trained cattle dogs, shooed horses, and groomed donkeys. He was well-respected in his trade, and his clients would bring their horses to him from all across the local area. He was described as quiet and dedicated to his work, which epitomized the country lifestyle Kelsey herself had grown up with. The two got to talking over the dating website. They were separated by multiple states, but this didn't stop them. They began a long-distance relationship, and within only a few months, Kelsey was planning her move to Colorado to be closer to him. Kelsey became pregnant early in 2017, but she and Patrick didn't move in together, and they remained living apart in October 2017 when their daughter Kaylee was born. They shared parenting duties, but this led to strain in their relationship and in their own lives. When Kelsey started working again after taking some time off for maternity, she had to deal with a punishing commute and Patrick was reluctant to leave the ranch. He rarely came to visit Kelsey, but Kelsey would visit him. This was the way their relationship continued into 2018, with Kelsey struggling to balance her job, her baby, and her relationship with Patrick, to whom she was engaged, though they hadn't planned out the wedding. Naturally, the fiancé is the first port of call for the police in a missing person situation like this one. When Kelsey failed to answer any of her mom Cheryl's calls or texts all the last week of November, Cheryl was worried for her daughter's welfare, and on December 2nd, she called the Woodland Park Police. Kelsey, we just want you home. Call us if you can, and we won't quit looking. The police conducted a welfare check at Kelsey's house. Kelsey was nowhere to be found, and a missing persons investigation was initiated. The investigators contacted her fiancé, Patrick Frazee, in order to establish a timeline and, of course, to discover if he might have been involved in something suspicious. Investigators swarmed the home of the fiancé of a missing Colorado mother. Kelsey Barrett was last seen Thanksgiving Day. Today, investigators are at the home of Patrick Frazee in Florissant. The Woodland Park Police Department says finding the 29-year-old is its number one priority. Last night, the community in Florissant held a vigil for the missing mother. Well, investigators, including an FBI task force, are helping execute that warrant at Frazee's home. We have seen them removing items from a barn. Frazee's attorney said again this morning he is cooperating with law enforcement. He also says Frazee was not asked to voluntarily participate in the search, but wants investigators to take any steps to find Kelsey Barrett and exclude him as a suspect. The police see all kinds of relationships, and it's unlikely they were phased by Patrick and Kelsey's distant co-parenting situation. But it still seemed strange when Patrick told them he hadn't seen Kelsey since Thanksgiving, November 22nd, and hadn't raised the alarm though that made 10 days without seeing his fiancée, supposedly the love of his life. He also didn't attend the press conference when Kelsey's family appealed for her safe return. November 22nd was the day of that final, fateful CCTV footage, capturing Kelsey shopping with her daughter in Safeway. The timestamp on this footage was 12.27 p.m., Receipts from the store and found at her home corroborated this timing. Patrick said he saw Kelsey for the final time only about 20 minutes later. He told police he had met with Kelsey to exchange custody of Kaylee, their daughter, in an alleyway outside Kelsey's house. He said he also gave her back some of her belongings, including a personal handgun and keys to her house and her car. This was because... And this was the biggest revelation of his conversation with police. He and Kelsey had apparently ended their relationship only in the past week. 
Patrick Frazee had turned from a loving, if distant, fiancé into an ex, and also the last person to see Kelsey alive. He said that their breakup had happened the day before Thanksgiving, the day before he last saw her alive, and that it had happened on Kelsey's terms and at Kelsey's request. She wanted them to go their separate ways, he said, with a 50-50 share of custody because they just weren't meshing anymore. The investigators could understand why Patrick was giving back Kelsey's keys, but why had Patrick had her gun? He said he'd taken it from her for her own safety, claiming that she'd been unstable and depressed, possibly suicidal. Her friends and family disagreed, but with Kelsey missing, there was only Patrick's word to go on. But there was also technological evidence, surveillance footage and phone records. These phone records showed that Kelsey had visited Patrick at his ranch in Florissant the night before, as he said, and they had contact seven times between the hours of 1 and 4 a.m. When Kelsey returned to her home in Woodland Park, her neighbor had a surveillance camera that overlooked her front door, which corroborated this timeline. Kelsey then messaged Patrick when she woke up on November 22nd at 9.37 a.m. They spoke on the phone for about three and a half minutes until about 9.40 a.m. Patrick then called her again right after she was captured on CCTV leaving Safeway at 12.31 p.m., ostensibly to arrange meeting up to exchange care of their daughter. Both their phones pinged on the same Woodland Park cell tower, which corroborated Patrick's account. He was then spotted on surveillance footage in Walmart, carrying a baby carrier identical to that Kelsey had been carrying in Safeway. This footage, taken between 12.54 and 1.17 p.m., supported his claim that they'd met up to exchange Kelly in the gap between the two store visits. So far, so good. But there was something Patrick was forgetting in the story he gave to police, the surveillance camera at Kelsey's neighbor's house. Because at 1.24 p.m., this camera captured him arriving at Kelsey's home again, half an hour after the encounter he claimed had been their last. He was seen going in and out of her house multiple times that afternoon, until he left for the last time at 4.30 p.m. Kelsey, meanwhile, was seen entering her house at 1.23 p.m. with Patrick and never leaving. This footage was deeply suspicious. Patrick had been the last person to see his missing fiancée alive and he'd lied about the timeline of the day. He claimed that Kelsey had remained in contact with him by phone through November 25th, three days later. Cell phone records did indeed display a history of communication between the couple across those three days, including a text from Patrick apparently referencing their breakup. If this is truly what you want, I'll respect your wishes and give you space. On November 25th, a text had also been sent from her phone to the company she worked for, Doss Aviation, telling them she'd be taking a week off from work. This did nothing to explain her absence. In fact, it focused the police's attention even closer on Patrick and Kelsey's cell phone records. Far from exonerating Patrick in his fiancée's disappearance, these records would prove to be damning. Each call or text made using a cellular network logs information about that transmission, including the particular cell tower used for the communication. As a result, Investigators can use this information to determine an approximate area the phone was in when it made a certain call or text. At the time Kelsey called Patrick at 12.31 p.m., both their phones were connected to the same cell tower in Woodland Park, indicating their proximity to each other. This accorded with Patrick's story about meeting to swap custody. But, contrary to his story, the phones continued to be connected to the same cell towers into the evening, with the location data indicating that they were traveling together in the same direction near Cripple Creek. Both phones were also connected to the cell tower in Florissant, the location of Patrick's ranch, the next day, November 23rd, when Patrick made a call to Kelsey's phone. 
Similar activity was recorded the day after that, November 24th, and the last activity on Kelsey's phone occurred on November 25th, when it was used to text her workplace from a cell tower in Idaho. This correlation with Patrick's phone data raised two possibilities. The first, that Patrick had lied about when he'd last seen Kelsey because she had left Woodland Park with him on Thanksgiving Day, bringing her phone with her. The second possibility was that she'd never left at all, and Patrick had taken her phone. The second explanation was supported by Kelsey's neighbor's security camera. It didn't show Kelsey leaving the property, only her fiancé. But why would Patrick take her phone? And what had happened to her inside the house? The likeliest explanation was turning out to be the most horrific. That Patrick had returned to his fiancé's house that cold Thanksgiving afternoon to murder her, with their one-year-old daughter dozing unsuspecting in a car seat just nearby. The final ping of Kelsey's cell phone in Gooding, Ohio, 800 miles from home, seemed designed to send the police on a wild goose chase looking for her in that area. But with Patrick's story not adding up, the police focused their investigation much closer to home. They conducted a thorough search of Kelsey's home and found that items like clothing, toiletries, and other cosmetics were still there. Items she wouldn't leave home without if she were going on a trip to somewhere as far away as Idaho. They also found that some expected items were missing, including her purse, her driver's license, and her car keys, though her car was still parked outside the property. Kelsey's family were staying in her house while she was missing, and they reported that they'd noticed that a bath rug that had previously been near the toilet in the bathroom was missing. They'd also noted stains of an unknown substance near the base of the toilet. When the forensic team examined these stains, they discovered them to be blood. Blood was also found on the bathtub, towel rack, door handle, and ceiling. A DNA match was found, and this blood was confirmed to be Kelsey Barreth's. These clues added up to paint a horrifying picture. This no longer was a missing persons case, it was a murder investigation. And the prime suspect? Patrick Frazee. On December 13th, 11 days after Kelsey was first reported missing, the police executed a search warrant on Patrick's ranch house. They did not find Kelsey's body. They did, however, discover a bottle of bleach and a mop, both testing positive for blood. They also found a document dated December 12, 2018, listing five people who could provide medical care for the couple's daughter, Kaylee, in the event that Patrick was absent or unavailable. This list did not include Kelsey, perhaps because by December 12, Patrick knew that Kelsey was dead. The investigators then paid closer attention to Patrick's other calls. He had shared several calls with an Idaho-based number around the time of Kelsey's disappearance in the last few weeks of November. This Idaho number belonged to a woman named Crystal Kenny Lee. Born in Twin Falls, Idaho, Crystal was a 32-year-old nurse and mother of two. She'd been student body president in high school and was active in sports like volleyball and basketball, and most notably, rodeo. Her family was well known in the local rodeo circuit, and she loved nothing more than her horses. In 2008, she was crowned Queen of the Magic Valley Rodeo. She'd been married for eight years, but that marriage had fallen apart and by summer 2018 she was divorced. So, what did this divorced rodeo queen, two states away, have to do with Kelsey Barreth and Patrick Frazee? On December 14, 2018, the FBI called Crystal to question her on her involvement in this case, which had escalated to cross state lines. She said she talked to Patrick in the last month, which seemed like an understatement when looking at the multiple calls they'd placed to each other in just the last week. She said she'd been at Patrick's ranch on November 24th to look at some horses, which she said was the sum of their relationship, that they had no personal connection. 
She also said she'd never met Kelsey and didn't know who she was until she saw an online news article about the disappearance, but Crystal was lying. Like Patrick and Kelsey, Patrick and Crystal shared a common interest, horses. They'd met at a rodeo just after finishing high school and dated during college, and they'd rekindled this relationship in 2016, while both of them were married to other people. A little while after this phone call, the FBI received a tip from a woman named Michelle Stein, a paralegal in Idaho who'd been a friend of Crystal's for years. She said that on or about October 22nd, 2018, Crystal had confessed to her that Patrick had asked her to, quote, take care of his baby mama. Patrick had asked Crystal to kill Kelsey Barreth only a month before Kelsey's murder. He told Crystal he wanted Kelsey dead because she wanted to take him to court to get custody of their daughter and that he was afraid for his daughter's life when she was around Kelsey. But witnesses' evidence testified to the very opposite situation. Their daughter Kaylee was born three weeks premature and so needed extra medical care. When the doctors tried to take her into a different room, Patrick became angry and verbally abusive with staff. To the extent that social services was notified, Kaylee was removed from the couple's care until the safety evaluation was complete, confirming that Kelsey was not being abused by Patrick. No further action was taken, but was this a grave sign of things to come? When the investigators returned to Crystal with the testimony of her friend Michelle, she folded and told them everything. She told them Patrick had begun talking about killing Kelsey in September 2018. He claimed that Kelsey was an abusive parent who'd hurt their daughter on multiple occasions, including once with an iron. No complaints had ever been filed and no medical reports existed to evidence this. Patrick had approached Crystal about killing Kelsey three times. First, he suggested she poison Kelsey by bringing her her favorite drink from Starbucks, a caramel macchiato with Ambien and Valium in it. Crystal got as far as Kelsey's front door. With an invented story about how the coffee was a thank you for Kelsey supposedly rescuing her dogs, but she couldn't bring herself to poison the coffee. The second time, Patrick gave Crystal a metal pipe and told her to go to Kelsey's house and attack her with it. Again, Crystal went to Kelsey's house but couldn't go through with the plan and drove back to Idaho. The third time was much the same. She waited outside Kelsey's house, this time with an aluminum baseball bat, but chickened out and drove home. By November 22nd, Patrick had clearly lost patience. He called Crystal at around 4.30 p.m. on Thanksgiving Day, around the same time he was seen leaving Kelsey's house on CCTV. He asked her to come to Colorado, saying she had a mess to clean up. She couldn't make it until the 24th, when she lied to her ex-husband, whom she was still living with, about going to a friend's party and then helping a friend move. On the 24th, she borrowed the car of her friend Megan and sent Megan a text asking if she could stay the night to establish an alibi. Instead, Crystal drove all the way to Woodland Park with bleach, gloves, a hairnet, and shoe covers, ready to clean up what she already understood to be Kelsey Barreth's murder scene. Moving into the bathroom here, just a little corner. Can you uh, tell me what you saw in here and what you cleaned up? Um, I didn't see anything. I was specifically told to clean the bathroom. Okay. So, but I didn't see anything. Um, there might have been blood. There was a lot of blood. So Where? they're on the floor, all over the floor. Um, and, and there, so there may have been um, bloody footprints in here. Kelsey's house was covered in blood, but there was no sign of her body. As directed by Patrick, Crystal spent the next four hours cleaning, throwing away the things she couldn't get clean, like baby toys and books, into trash bags. Having cleaned the crime scene, she took these items to Cripple Creek, where she met Patrick, so they could pick up Kelsey's body. 
On Thanksgiving Day, Patrick had hidden Kelsey's body in a bag on top of a haystack in a barn. Now, two days later, he and Crystal drove the body back to his ranch in Florissant and along with the bloody items from Kelsey's house, burned it in a trough. I removed uh, belongings from the trunk um, and put them into the burn. Was the fire going at the time? Yes. Were you present when he started the fire? Yes, I was. You've seen some wild things in your career. I'm just curious what your initial reaction was when you got her full story. When I, it was really, I, I had to take a second. It's, it's hard to understand what Crystal did and why she did it. I was dumbfounded and mm -hmm. I didn't know how to digest it. It, it, it took, took a couple days for it to, to really sink in and the gravity of the situation. And She's an intelligent woman. Um, she is a good mom. The decisions that she made and why, I, I, I will never understand. And quite frankly, I'm not sure um, any of us will ever understand. To cover his tracks, Patrick wanted Crystal to take the remains of Kelsey's body back to Idaho with her. She refused. However, she agreed to take Kelsey's phone and help him plant a false trail with calls and texts, pretending Kelsey was still alive. This was the murderous pair's fatal mistake. A cell phone tower pinging trail that led from Colorado to Idaho and linked them both to this awful crime. Crystal explained to the police that Patrick had lured Kelsey into a false sense of security at home that Thanksgiving day. He had blindfolded her on the pretext of having her sample the scents of different candles and with their one-year-old daughter in a playpen just across the house, beat Kelsey to death with a baseball bat. He hit her so hard in the face, he dislodged a tooth, which Crystal later found while cleaning. If you remember where the tooth was, he used the broom. Around the tooth, what was there, if anything? Spot the police later found a human tooth near the burn site on Patrick's ranch. According to Crystal, Kelsey's final words were, please stop. On December 21st, 2018, Patrick Frazee was arrested and charged with the murder of Kelsey Barrett, his fiance and the mother of his child. In a case without a body or much physical evidence, it was Crystal's own testimony that would put him away. She'd cut a deal with prosecutors in which she would only face the charge of evidence tampering in exchange for her cooperation. And she cooperated fully. She claimed she had been in love with Patrick, but aware of his dark side, and feared for her own safety, which is why she went along with his twisted plans. She told her friends he was threatening her and her children, saying little girls go missing off the playground all the time. But regardless of her reasoning, she knew every detail of the murder and was believable to the jury. There was also a surprise witness who emerged during the trial. One of Patrick's fellow prisoners came forward and said that Patrick had given him a hit list, made up of 16 different notes and instructions to use his prison gang connections to have key witnesses in the trial killed, including Kelsey's mother and Crystal herself. There were no depths to which Patrick wouldn't sink to get himself out of this mess, but it worked against him. After three and a half hours of deliberation, the jury found Patrick Frazee guilty of murder in the first degree, and he was sentenced to life in prison plus 156 years. His motive for murdering his fiancée is unclear. During the trial, his financial problems emerged, including a legal battle with his siblings for their late father's assets, valued at around $400,000. He defaulted on a $70,000 loan, and he was required to pay $700 a month in child support to Kelsey, but the last payment was $150 short. Patrick was also known for disparaging Kelsey in front of clients, calling her absolutely crazy and describing her as bipolar and in rehab. He claimed Kelsey had taken off shortly after Kaylee was born, which was not the case. 
This, combined with his accusations of abuse spoken to Crystal, painted a picture of a hostile relationship, potentially abusive. Crystal was sentenced to three years for felony evidence tampering. However, in 2021, the Colorado Court of Appeals threw out this sentence because it exceeded the maximum sentence allowed by her plea agreement. She was resentenced to 18 months with the same start date, meaning that in March 2021 she was paroled. Patrick remains in prison. His and Kelsey's daughter, Kaylee, is now six years old. What do you think about this tragic story? What do you think of Crystal's resentencing? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Until next time, stay safe, keep up with our channel, and we will see you very soon on The Decoder.